Hello and welcome back to the Interfaith Roundtable. I'm Cantor Mark Perman and I'm pleased to welcome Elizabeth Esty, who is the U.S. Representative for the 5th Congressional District of Connecticut. She was elected to Congress on November 6, 2012. She serves on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and the Committee on Science, Space and Technology. The Congresswoman also serves on the Congressional Gun Violence Prevention Task Force. She is focused on job creation, economic development, as well as reinvigorating the district's manufacturing base. She is a strong proponent of small business and in promoting the green jobs of the future. And I'm pleased to welcome her to the Interfaith Roundtable today. Welcome, Congresswoman. Thank you very much, Mark. So what are some of the main issues? One of the issues that struck me is trying to reinvigorate American domestic manufacturing. Is such a thing possible considering all these jobs being shipped overseas, and what are you doing about it? Absolutely. In fact, there's a tremendous opportunity right now, and we're beginning to see that in the manufacturing jobs coming back, and the jobs numbers in manufacturing have been growing in the last few months. Mm -hmm. Part of that is based on the fact that energy is going to become cheaper in the United States with these various new technologies that are used for extraction, that we are seeing the cost of energy coming down in the U.S., and that's a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. We've always had strong skill set, and that's really Connecticut's base. You know, that's our strength, and that's one of the reasons I'm so excited about the opportunities for rebuilding on that base and educating new workers, mm -hmm. retraining current workers who have lost their jobs during the recession, but also getting young people with these same skills so they can com be competitive globally. Right. So now you're focused on trying to increase jobs in Connecticut, yet what I hear as a clergy is that a lot of young families are not coming into Connecticut because it's such a high cost of living and a lot of jobs are moving elsewhere. Um, do you have to kind of work with the governor on this? Is this kind of a cooperative thing to try to bring business back in? And, and what's being done correctly, what's being done incorrectly to get businesses back into to Connecticut? Do you well, think? I think there need to be a lot of partnerships, frankly, right now. This isn't a, a problem that Congress alone can solve, nor can the state and the governor or state legislature. I've served in local office. I served in the mm -hmm. town council in Cheshire. I served as a state representative. And I think that background, plus having been involved with small businesses, I really see all those different perspectives. The truth is we're never going to be a low-cost state. We're just not. We, we value education. We support education. We support the environment. You look at these beautiful pictures here. You think about mm -hmm. the greenways and bike riding and, and parks here in mm -hmm. Simsbury and around our state. We invest in our environment, we invest in education, and those, those things cost money. Now, it also improves the quality of life. So there's always going to be demand for people who are highly skilled to live in our wonderful state of Connecticut. And I think that's what we build on. So I see the strength in biotech and bioengineering. If you look at Jackson Labs coming in to Farmington, that's an enormous opportunity, not only for postdoc jobs, but also for lab techs, for the folks who are going to work in that facility, they estimate mm -hmm. 300 jobs, most of them highly skilled, highly paid, that will really help in reinvigorate our economy right here in this region, right mm -hmm. next to Simsbury, people who are going to live in Simsbury who will have those jobs. In addition, we have advanced manufacturing as well as traditional manufacturing. Let's take a step back for people who haven't really gotten a chance to know you. I mean, you were my congresswoman. I, I met you for the first time. A lot of times you see politicians defined by the media. You know, you're getting a filtered view, and if it's a, a media source that's supportive of you, you'll get one view. If it's a media source that doesn't like what you have to say, you might get another point of view. Then you have all the ads. So beyond that entire, I guess you want to call it, cavalcade of information, tell people a little bit about who you are, what your vision, and why you're doing this. Sure. why you withstood some of the pressure of a campaign and, and the negatives and the hardships and all that to, to do this? Well, I have a background as an attorney uh, back before I have children, but my children who are coming up on 24, 21, and 18 in the next couple of months, mm -hmm. you can see I spent a good 15, 16 years of my life as, principally as, as the mom. A lot of chauffeuring in the mini minivan, lots of hockey, practices and soccer games and baseball games and karate, you name it, my kids did all of that. And so I spent a lot of time in the community 
helping organize a nursery school, serving and ultimately ended up serving on the town council after being on the library board and doing many of the volunteer things that make our communities like Simsbury so wonderful. Mm. You get a lot of public service in volunteer positions, whether it's Kiwanis or whether it's at the temple or whether it's in town government. So I came from a tradition where my grandmother had had a radio program. I know mm, you talked about your yeah. radio program. What station? Uh, this was in Chicago oh, in the wow. 40s and 50s. Wow. And, but she was also involved with the Board of Education outside of Chicago. And she was so upset by the northern face of segregation and the impact on children that she became a lobbyist on civil rights. And so during the McCarthy era, she took the train every week to go to Washington and lobby on civil rights. So you were inspired by her? By I was very much actions? inspired by my grandmother. Because that wasn't an era when women were encouraged no, to do that. No, women didn't yeah. work, much less have their own radio wow. program, much less be the wow. first lobbyist for the Presbyterian Church, which is what she was. So she was. was like a pioneer. She was, and, mm -hmm. and my parents were both very active in civic uh, involvement, United Way, League of Women Voters. So I come from a long line of activists. Mm -hmm. um, and in my case, it, it led to elected work. But on some level, like, if someone says, I'm going to run for Congress, someone has to say, really? I mean, <laughs> so you have to think big, but you can't be too ego-driven to think, well, I can't do Obviously, you're successful, so you made it. But where, where is that little fire that goes, you know, I can take it a step further. I can go to the next step. I have the potential to do what the other person's doing better than they're doing it. Well, uh, in our case, we had an open seat. So it was oh, going to okay. be someone new. And, that, and there is a little okay. different assessment, I think. I wasn't running against anybody. Right. I was running for mm. certain values, uh, a proposition about civic involvement. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I really ended up going down this road in 2005. And you and I talked a little bit beforehand. And prior to that, I was seriously thinking about maybe going to divinity school, which I raised because yeah. this is an mm -hmm, interfaith mm -hmm, roundtable. Mm -hmm. Either divinity school or possibly getting more involved in politics. Mm -hmm. And it was my daughter, Sarah, who at the time was 15, who really pushed me in the direction towards politics because I was, well, I was reading the local paper. My three kids were at the table. And I was probably saying not terribly complimentary things about some of the folks in local office decisions I disagreed with. And she looked at me and said, Mom, you know that tone of voice teenagers have, mm -hmm. Mom, you always told me, if you see something you can fix, fix it yourself. Fix it. You've yeah. been asked to run. How are you angry? You could run. Mm -hmm. I, I, it was mostly around budget decisions for the schools. I was oh. very active in the schools, volunteering in the schools. Mm -hmm. And I disagreed with some cuts that were being proposed for the school budget. And she said, you know, they ask you to run every year. We're old enough. I'll run your campaign. That was the kicker. I'll run your campaign, but you should run or don't complain. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that. And I thought, you know what, she's right. I do believe that democracy is not a spectator sport. It requires people to be willing to run and serve. And if I could run and I'm not willing to do it, mm -hmm. then I do lose my right to complain. But you got a few challenges, which is to run for the higher offices. You need more money. You need all these ads. But then you have the specter of what happened to a, a Gabby Giffords in, in Arizona and the crazy people who are out there with, with guns and the security issues. So did that factor into the, the thinking of, my God, look what happened to her. I'm going to put myself out there on an even higher public level. Now everybody will recognize me, which is nice, I guess, but also well, who's that nut well, who doesn't agree with me? It's something that we <laughs> talked about. Right. We talked about it. It had to be a family decision. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have done it if my family mm -hmm. hadn't been supportive in recognizing it's an imposition on mm -hmm. our privacy for children who were teenagers and in college, mm -hmm. recognizing you're going to be scrutinized. People will be saying nasty things about your mother, maybe even about you. And so they, they had to be aware of that and, and supportive, but they've been wonderfully supportive. Why can't candidates, I mean, I'm naive, why can't candidates sit down before a campaign and say, okay, look, we're going to agree not to bash each other. I'm not going to show commercials that portray you in a bad light with the worst picture I can find of you and vice versa. We're just going to spell out the issues. Here's what I think. Here's what you think. And we're going to present it to the public. And if they like my point of view, they'll vote for me. If they like you, they'll vote for you. But we won't bash each other. Why can't candidates sit down, agree to that, and then have that kind of campaign? Is that really naive? You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in right now, I believe, mm -hmm. is truly because of 
<coughs> Citizens United in, in this sort of mm -hmm. endless flow of money that has mm -hmm. really gotten so dominant in the political process. Mm -hmm. It's one of the reasons I'm such a strong advocate for public financing. I ran under public financing as a state representative uh, when I first ran in 08 and then again in 2010. So I'm a really strong advocate because I think a limited budget and raising only in small amounts from people who you would represent is tremendously important for that sort of accountability and keeping tightly focused on what you stand for rather than you know let the other person make their own case and you make your case and and that is I think a vastly superior system in part it, it allows mm -hmm. us the time to really just focus on doing the job and it also means frankly you don't have the money to do both so you better just make your someone own someone else suggested to me it was just you know in talking congressional terms are too short because you're basically having to now run for your, I don't know if it's true, but tell me, to start thinking about your next campaign because it's only less than two years if you want to run again, and now you're busy being distracted by doing that rather than focusing on the people's business. So is that, is that a concern, or is it just be the best you can be and the people will love you for what you do and the opponent won't have a chance because your work is so good? I mean, well, you know what I'm saying? it's <laughs> certainly a lot of people have talked about longer terms. Right. Um, is that again, true? A Constitutionally, we can't do it. You know, mm -hmm. you'd have to change the Constitution. So mm -hmm. I've got to be as effective as I can be with the situation we have now. So I spend, I spend a lot of time every time I can. I'm here, home in Connecticut. I'm back every single weekend, no matter what we have in terms of voting. I'm back every weekend. I'm blissfully home this whole week. Mm -hmm. And so I spend the time when I'm home. I'm out seeing people. I'm meeting with folks at you know, holding round tables. Today, um, I'm going to be at Fitzgerald's oh, cool. to do yeah. Congress on Your Corner. So really to be around and hearing from folks as much as possible, because that's essential. Yeah. It's essential. You cannot be a representative if you aren't hearing in close contact with folks yeah. all over your district. I, I wanted to, we talked a little bit about that before, and I wanted to tell you from my history reading, you have something in, com you have something in parallel with Abraham Lincoln, who was a congressman for one term, and then took some views that really went against his constituents, including his opposition to the Mexican War and something, certain views on slavery held at that time. So he ended up with one term. And, but the fact that you stood against, for your principles, against what the majority felt when you were in the state we were talking about, you uh, were against capital punishment and are against capital punishment, but your constituents at that time were. To what extent are you obligated to really represent the people and vote the way they want you to vote, even if you personally don't agree with it? Well, it's a really important question about mm -hmm. what representative democracy means. Mm -hmm. um, just so that people know the background, because you wouldn't necessarily in Simsbury. Mm -hmm. I was serving in local office when the horrible, awful Pettit murders happened a mile from my house in a neighborhood I know very, very What's well. What's the background on for those? Background was the home invasion oh, of the yeah, family. Yeah, yeah. Um, with horrible, awful, awful murders. Yep. Yep. And the trial, I'd been a lifelong opponent of the death penalty for religious reasons and also mm -hmm. because I've worked on cases and I know it's not fairly applied many, mm -hmm. much of the time. And knowing that, I'd always been a strong opponent for the death penalty, really believe we should abolish it. Mm -hmm. And people knew that when I got elected in 2008. Well, in 2010, that position was exceptionally unpopular during the first trial of, of the killers for very understandable reasons. I mean, it's about as awful a murder as you can imagine in yep. your community. Um, but I really strongly believe part of what you do when you're a representative is to exercise your judgment and your wisdom. And if people weren't, if people were so focused on keeping their job, I would never have had the right to vote. African Americans would have never had the right to vote in this country because there are times when positions, or if you take something like slavery, you needed a leader like mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln willing to take those positions. And so my view is you don't deserve to have the job if you're not willing to lose it. Mm -hmm. That there are positions that it's worth losing your job yeah. over. Can't be a lot of them. You better pick and choose carefully. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you do, you are expected to stand for something, which may not always be in agreement at that moment. With what your but what about the want? flip side of the person who says, you know, I voted for so and so, and they're going against everything I believe in. And if I call the office, you know, and an intern gets back to me, no offense, or an associate mm -hmm. says, that's nice, I'll, I'll send it to the congresswoman or congressman. 
but they don't feel like their opinion really matters, that you're going to kind of go off and do what you want to do. So to what extent, you know, are you really obligated if, even if, forget that issue. Personally, you have certain views, but your constituents seem to be hammering towards another point of view. Do you have to sublimate that sometimes to the, be a representative? It's, it's always a mix, you mm -hmm. know, it's, and it's an imperfect world that you live in, mm -hmm. and there are issues that you're going to have to compromise on. So you're going to have, mm -hmm. there are votes I'll take that will have everybody mad at me to some extent because the only way to move an issue forward was to compromise will, will be too much for some people, not enough for others. So that's inherently part of the process. Explain to me the point when I watch C-SPAN and there are co congresswomen, congressmen going up and speaking to an empty chamber. Ah. Doesn't that feel a little silly to you when you do it? I'll tell you, we have, <laughs> I, people are giving speeches during times committees are meeting. Right. So that, so that you understand what's happening with that mm -hmm. as part of that is that we're having committee meetings at the same time that the floor is open. That's right. just the way it's structured. So people may be speaking on a variety of issues, and sometimes you'll see people talking about someone's 100th birthday, and sometimes they might be talking about our involvement in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So it really runs the gamut, which is why you have to do your own homework. You have to do your own homework, study those issues, talk to your colleagues, and really talk to folks in your district about issues. How are they going to affect people at home? How is this going to make an impact? And that's, that's part of the reason why I encourage people to contact me by email, by phone, be in touch about issues, and why we reach out. If a big bill's coming up, I'll, I'll make a bunch of phone calls to people and say, how will this affect Chambers of Commerce? How are small businesses thinking about this issue? When I watch C-SPAN and I watch the House of Commons, even though they kind of yell at each other and insult each other, it's all in fun. I don't know if you ever watched that. They're all there, but they're all listening, responding, playing off, and it's really fascinating to watch it. And I wish, unless I don't see it, I wish the Congress had something like, you seems to be a speech, I, def I defer to so-and-so, they speak, I defer, I have a comment, blah, blah. But you never see people kind of interacting the way they do in the House of Commons of like point, point, counterpoint, point, point. Is that missing? That debate? I, I think discussion? it is missing. I would love to see more of that. You see uh -huh. that in committee more often. Right. Um, but I do think that's part of how we need to change the tone. And, and right. I suspect viewers are going to be interested in you know, what do we do about this lack of civility? What do we do about the gridlock? And, and I have to tell you, I'm mm -hmm. more optimistic than bo most. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have run for office if I weren't more optimistic. And, and I see little green shoots of hope in the scorched earth of the House of Representatives. And, and part of that is that there are 90 new members this year. That's 90 out of 435. You have a little freshman group. There's a least. big freshman group. That's, uh -huh. um, that's over 20% mm -hmm. are new. Yeah. And, and our group is pretty evenly split. It's slightly more Democrats, 51 Democrats. But we've made an effort of this freshman group to get together informally about once a month. We'll have pizza and beer together. It's just an open invitation. Mm -hmm. Get together someplace around Capitol Hill. I've made a real effort to get to know the folks on my floor, where my office is. We walk over and vote together, and we, we talk about issues as we're walking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Our class has made a real effort, and I personally made a lot of effort to get to know my committee chairs, my committee members of both sides of the aisle. And the amendments that I've done, the bills that I've done, I've sought out Republican support because in this district, 45% yeah. of the voters. Right here have chosen the party of none of the above, mm -hmm. the neither of your party's party. So I'm not doing my job as a Democrat. I was elected to represent the 5th District, to represent mm -hmm. Simsbury and the 40 other cities and towns. Yeah. And to do that, I need to be thinking about Connecticut, Northwest and Central Connecticut, and the American people, not a political party. So that's the way I think about my job. Let's talk a little bit about the Voting Rights Act uh, decision, because progressives have described it as the Voting Rights Act was gutted. Then I read it, I guess I'm one of these wonks who likes to read it and read the decision, and I don't think it was quite gutted. I th correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is the states sort of made the case that they no longer engaged in certain discriminatory practices, therefore they didn't have to go to the Justice Department every time they wanted to change a voting law or something. Now Clarence Thomas voted with the majority, but then there was some huge, I mean, I couldn't believe some of the stuff people were saying. One African-American commentator equated what Thomas did with Hitler, uh, with Jews colluding with, the Hit with Hitler. 
Um, he was called an Uncle Tom by people in his own. So that kind of rhetoric, even if you disagree with it profoundly, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm worried about that kind of rhetoric coming at people when they just disagree with you. I mean, well, I think there is an issue about <laughs> civility, and, and uh -huh. as we tell our kids, right. we should model what we want to see. And so I do try to be careful about the tone that I use, and you can respectfully, strongly, but still respectfully mm -hmm. disagree. And I do think that's something we need to get back into not just the political process, but frankly on the side of the media too, which has tended to feature, I think, s strong opinions that are intemperate and often very personally derogatory, which don't advance the conversation. Yeah. We need to make it safe for people to run for office. We need to make it safe for people to express their opinions respectfully. It doesn't mean we're going to agree, but it does mean we have to get everyone to the table. Now, I would never go if I were on the opposite side on a Bill O'Reilly or a uh, Sean Hannity show because they're just going to cut you off and not give you a chance to speak. Then what's the point of that? Well, it's, it's part of the reason that my <laughs> focus is really on being present in the district, meeting with folks in small groups, one-on-one, -on -one, in the grocery store, you know, on the bike trail, mm -hmm. wherever it is, because then people feel free to say what they really think. You can actually have a conversation. And I think Americans are really eager to have conversations about the direction of this country. So, you know, and we do need to figure out what we're going to do about jobs. We do need to address, for example, right now, we've got, as of yesterday, July 1st, it's today, it's July 2nd while we're taping this, mm -hmm. um, student interest loan rates are doubling. Well, this is ridiculous, and it's completely unnecessary. Both parties know that we shouldn't be doing that, but we need to get a compromise together. I've been supporting Joe, Joe Courtney's, you know, terrific proposal. Just Why two is more that year extension okay. because people are fighting about the way that if the kids are really tired. I don't know if you have children, but I no, certainly no, had but, plenty no. of time with my Teach three them. kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they get tired. It's the end of the day and they don't even know why they're fighting anymore. And I feel sometimes in the House of Representatives, it, it, people are so used to fighting, they've forgotten that we actually can compromise and we should sit down, take a deep breath, and listen to what our constituents are telling us who don't want these interest rates to go spiking up through the roof. Well, why would and anybody want out, that? <laughs> and, and figure out a way yeah. to, if we can't agree right now, let's extend it for a couple of years and, and buy some time to and really work out a compromise that we can agree on and give ourselves a chance to do that, that rather than holding students and their families hostage when tuition bills are sitting on people's desks right now waiting to be paid. From where you sit, the inability to compromise, of course, the Republicans lay at Obama's desk. He's willing, willing to a compromise. He doesn't, you know, from, the Repu from their point of view, the Republicans don't compromise. I know, I'm sure I know what you're going to come down on, but is it a universal problem that there's just this philosophical unwillingness to, I mean, where's that coming from? It used to be Kennedy and, um, what's his name, um, well, McCain, or Kennedy and Orrin Hatch and people like that who, I mean, they were this sides apart, but they sat down, they came up, McCain-Feingold is a mm -hmm. perfect example on the campaign finance. De Democrat, liberal, conservative, Republican came together on campaign finance. Like, can that happen again, or is that dead? I, it certainly better <laughs> happen again. I, I right. hope. I hope it can. And one of one of the things that I've concluded mm -hmm. from my first six months is that personal relationships in Congress as well as in life are tremendously mm -hmm. important. You know what? Mm -hmm. If you if you know folks in business, they'll tell you, you don't negotiate with people you don't trust. Mm. You don't trust people you don't know. And part of the problem in Congress is now people don't know each other. And that's part of my effort personally, mm -hmm. and I think in the freshman class we're making a serious effort, to get to know each other yeah. and, and find small things we can work on. For example, a number of us have been working on a number of veterans' issues, which we all share support for. Well, let's work together on those bills. We all put, we all work on them. We co-sponsor each other's bills. They get passed, and you know what? We've done something together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that mending of those relationships and finding areas of interest that overlap is the path forward. You, you know, you do that, you see everybody has a win. And then you look for more areas of common ground, and then you build on that common ground. But like back to the question about the Voting Rights Act and the, the DOMA, 
uh, which Bill Clinton had put into the Defense of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. There's so much passion on both sides of these issues. Would you agree that what happened in the voting rights decision is not the gutting of the Voting Rights Act? It was a look at one or two provisions that they felt they could change now, this being 2013? Or is it a gutting of the Voting Rights well, Act? Well, you know, again, my position now is mm -hmm. as a member of Congress. Mm -hmm. And the net result of that decision will require Congress to take action at a, at a time, frankly, where because of this gridlock, it's highly unlikely Congress will take action. The result of Congress not taking mm -hmm. action will mean that there's no review of those Do you changes. ever stand up there and say, let's really cut this out? I mean, we are not benefiting the American people. We are seeming self-serving. They are losing faith in their government. Kids don't want to go in. I mean, let's cut this out and change the entire dynamic. What would, what would it take to do that? Just a leader to go up there and, and blast everybody? Well, uh, it's a question of whether blasting, <laughs> again, I'm not sure that blasting everybody helps as much as yeah, these quiet conversations in part to say, look, mm -hmm. at, you know what you're hearing. I know what I'm hearing. We both want to be respected. We want to be respected in the eyes of our children mm -hmm. and our communities. Let's find something we can work on together. And, and I think sometimes those quiet conversations are better than pounding the pulpit. Uh -huh. I mean, if you think about what the mission is on an interfaith dialogue, yeah. you're not going to agree on everything, but you find... If your values are similar, if you're looking for points of overlap, mm -hmm. you find them. If you're looking for a fight, you're yeah. always going to find a fight. And and it's the same it's the same everywhere, whether it's you know in a community, in a household, mm -hmm. or in the U.S. Congress. If you're looking for controversy and conflict, you'll, you'll find, find it. it. In the minutes we have left, talk a little bit about your because it is the Interfaith Roundtable, as you mentioned. You know your connection to your faith and how you almost thought about going the ministry route but then went to the politics route. And someone might say, that's a separation issue of church and state. But they do connect. They are interconnected. I mean, our money says, in God we trust. I don't think we're taking that off yet. So how do both worlds connect for you? Well, for me, it informs the way I look at public service. Mm -hmm. And I think service can be in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Elected service is one form. Um, and some people talk about it being a calling. You know, it's being where you're meant to be. You hear that God phrase. God wants you to be like a spiritual. You can say God wants you to be there. I, f I feel like I'm there because I have something to do because mm -hmm. there are important things that need to be done. Right. Um, and I think that's what we all aspire to be. Mm -hmm. We all aspire to be doing meaningful work and trying to make the world better for other people. And at its best, elected office is one way of doing that. Hmm. Just as ministry is being a rabbi, being a cantor, being an imam, mm -hmm. being a priest, being a pastor, being a lay leader, all of those are different ways of service. And mm -hmm. in my case, this happened to be relatively late after my kids were grown, you know, in my 50s to really think this is something I would like to be part of that healing process for the country of making it safe for democracy to be done by, by citizens again. Wonderful. Congressman, Congresswoman. <laughs> See, I knew I'd get that wrong. Congresswoman Elizabeth Esty, been my guest on the Interfaith Roundtable. Any questions about the program, you can always email me at mjperman9 at gmail.com, mjperman9 at gmail.com. If folks have questions for you or comments, is there a comment line, or should they feed questions through me, and I'll send them sure, to you? Sure, no, absolutely. Okay. You can actually, if you, you can go do elizabeth.esty at mail.house.gov. Or actually, my office is here in New Britain, and, and frankly, if you just Google Elizabeth Esty, you can get links to both, both my office in D.C., but better yet, call here in Connecticut. Wonderful. I want to thank Phil on the camera, Rechna, did I say Rechna? I got it. And Althea, and Phyllis back there, and Karen, and all the folks at Simsbury TV. Thank you very much. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.